This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. If you've been listening to our podcasts and presentations over the past four years, you would have heard a phrase from me that should sound quite familiar to you now. The phrase would go something like this. Our civilization is in the midst of being transformed against our volitional allowance from an analog world of substance, material, and objective truth into a digital world of data, alchemy, and subjectivism. And while this warning of what is happening both around you and to you may have seemed kind of obscure and technical in years past, my words from the past may be coming back to you now, as our world is changing. And as previously warned, you will be experiencing a meta-system change. And things that I've warned about are all coming to fruition. And the acceleration of that change is about to make an exponential increase. This past week, While I was dealing with several weighty issues and traveling about the country, something was announced by our frenemies at Facebook. In the midst of a fully digital set, Mark Zuckerberg announced that Facebook would be transitioning to the corporate name of Meta. He further explains that this will all be about a metaverse transition from reflecting what was in the past, let's say, digital sharing of what was happening in the realm of the real world. That's what Facebook was. It reflected what was real. To now transitioning into a meta system where digital non-reality will be reflecting what is happening in the completely subjective digital world. So in essence, Facebook displays digitally in a wide reach form what is really happening in your life with your kids in the real world, with your thoughts about things that are happening in the real world, with pictures of what you did in vacation in the real world. Facebook was a mirror of the objective real. But if you will notice, something started to change over the past few years. Where just a few years ago, Facebook was a place where you could disagree debate and share various opinions in the objective and real pursuit of truth. Well, Facebook began to change its algorithm around 2012 and 2013. And all of a sudden, conservatives and conservative media didn't have the reach that they used to. And I don't mean by just a little, I mean a drop of up to 90% on average. This happened to one of our clients and friends, World Net Daily. It was suppression. Suppression of articles. Suppression of videos. Suppression of comments or posts that did not support what Facebook would refer to as their community standards. So Facebook was becoming a digital subjective community where there were new standards over what speech and imagery was safe for that community. Now, it was fine that Facebook was being used by the State Department to overthrow entire nations in North Africa and to lead revolutions in the Middle East. That was okay by Facebook community standards. And basically, Facebook, Google, and others became our State Department 2.0. And so now Facebook was suddenly about suppressing the free speech and open marketplace of ideas in the United States and was somehow about regime change in the Middle East. But it didn't stop there. Month by month, year by year, Facebook became gradually more and more stringent, even suppressing an article by sovereign nations that addressed Pueblos Sin Fronteras for being racist and xenophobic. An article, by the way, that was written for sovereign nations by Alan Keyes. And it continued to tighten and tighten. With major conservative media outlets all sharing verifiable information, they were being deplatformed. Now, that word was probably unfamiliar to all of us and most of us in 2016 deplatformed. But these conservative organizations were being deplatformed. What you could say was they were being 
digitally beheaded, taken to the guillotine, like many dissenters were in the French Revolution, ending their reach, ending their influence, because their views and their search for truth violated community standards. And all sorts of reasons were given, but the primary reason was to eliminate voices that would oppose the future transition and transformation of our world from an objective, real, physical world into a new community. A new community with new standards. A new community that is digital. And then Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg started to pour money into our elections across the nation attempting to influence the physical world, attempting to subvert the will of the people in the physical world. And during this time, Facebook explained what the rules would be about posting in regards to the results of the 2020 election. See, you couldn't announce who you thought won or any disagreements with the outcome until accredited media announced the results, and they let you know which news agencies would give you official results. And then you weren't allowed to disagree with those results, even if the physical president of the physical United States was censored in the new digital community. The new community that was going to ensure that the evil physical world would not interrupt the narrative of the digital and strangely spiritual world, much like Gnosticism. And then, on January 6, 2021, they digitally imprisoned the physical president of the United States. They basically held him for hostage, basically doing digitally what you would do in the old days when you took over a country. And everyone else in the digital world joined in, punishing and blaming the president of the United States for the Reichstag false flag moment on January 6th. Of course, charges that have never been proven to be true. So the digital world created their own subjective non-reality, their own truth, reflexively creating the truth that they wanted in a Pygmalion sense, carving a stone statue into their beautiful bride, and then making it real through a magical process, taking all sorts of bland elements and magically turning them into gold, alchemy, to end the physical, real, objective world, to end the objectively true, real presidency, to end the objectively true, real United States of America, and to bring our nation into the subjective, digital, postmodern, neo-Marxist states of America. An algoocracy, ruled by algorithm. A nation ruled by nonsense. A nation who will be ruled by a new, subjective, digital community. With its new community standards. You see, we have to defund the police now because that was policing of the old, objective, real laws. That physical law enforcement had to be done away with, you see. Because if you do away with law enforcement, you do away with law. And then you can have a Justice Department that isn't concerned about the old physical constitutional system of law. You see, we have new community standards, and justice isn't the primary concern. It is now social justice. And while the concern of the physical and real threat of the Biden administration is real, they are disrupting and dismantling America. They are creating the subjective alchemic world that they want a digital world. They are destroying so they can build back better and build back digital with problems that are purposely created, with crises that are purposely created to destroy the physical and the real and to create their Pygmalion dream state. They are Immunitizing the eschaton. They are creating a great reset of life and of reality as we know it. And the great lie exists on the other side of the metaverse 
a new digital supranation without the old laws and the old constitutional nation. Ending our nation. A digital and physical insurrection. You see, ladies and gentlemen, you are in the midst of a meta-system change. And to force all of us into a hive mentality, into a global brain. Now, I first spoke about this back in the early summer of 2020 on the causes of things. I tried to warn all of you about what was happening. And surprisingly, very few people listened to that episode. Maybe the title sounded a bit weird and conspiratorial. But that episode was probably one of the most important episodes that I have ever released. Because that is what this is all about. So, I have told you in the past that I would start to become the 2030 me, to help the 2021 you understand what is coming. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play that rather short episode again from The Causes of Things, The Global Brain, from July of 2020. Here goes. It's July 9th, 2020. Our civilization is in the midst of being transformed, against our volitional allowance, from an analog world of substance, material, and objective truth into a digital world of data, alchemy, and subjectivism. Properly stated, and against our own personal knowledge and volition, we are in the process of being coerced through a human metasystem transition. Metasystem transitions are events representing the evolutionary emergence of a higher level of organization through the integration of subsystems into a higher metasystem. Metasystems are generally understood first through mediums of communication that work as functions of control like language, writing, speaking, reading. And this communication in turn affects physical actions or things that require energy that turn into the action guided by mediums of communication, such as agriculture, distribution, energy, work. And these things need order. They need organization. So in past eras where traveling great distances was not what populations engaged in more than once or twice in their lives, we had human organization as tribes in ages past, which led to chiefdoms later on in kingdoms in our development post-Westphalia. And then... Lastly, as our communication became broader and distributed, mankind evolved into the nation-state concept. So our metasystems that we've had in our human organization has been agrarian first, then distributive, then industrial. But let's also understand our industrial revolutions, as this transition into the fourth industrial revolution that we were being forced into, and hence the Great Reset. So, like the first Industrial Revolution's steam-powered factories, the second Industrial Revolution's application of science to mass production and manufacturing, and the third Industrial Revolution's start into digitization, the fourth Industrial Revolution's technologies, such as artificial intelligence, genome editing, augmented reality, robotics, and 3D printing, it will also rapidly change the way humans create, exchange, and distribute Economically, this will profoundly transform institutions, systems, industries, and individuals, you and me. More importantly, this revolution will be guided by the choices that people make today. So for those that are trying to herald in the Great Reset into the Fourth Industrial Revolution, it's going to be heralding in a series of social, political cultural, and economic upheavals that will unfold currently as they try to push us forcibly into this. Building on the widespread availability of digital technologies that were the result of our previous third industrial revolution or digital revolution, this new Great Reset Fourth Industrial Revolution will be largely driven by the convergence of digital biological and physical innovations. Everything will be forced to change. All systems that we have had in our lives and in our previous generations will be considered obsolete. And those old systems, and those who are in charge of those old systems, 
will be forced to bend the knee of submission to the new systems. And hence, to achieve this, all old systems will be declared corrupt, sinful, racist, and relics of a bygone era. The fourth industrial revolution is distinguishable from the third because it's where humans meet the cyber world. In other words, where there is a transmutation that is occurring where technology and people are not distinct. Now, think about that for a second. We're not distinct in the sense to where we can even tell, we will be confused between what is real and what is not real, and not separate. Those of us that grew up in the 80s, we had the PC, the personal computer, and we had a life. (laughs) Today, our devices and sensors are becoming an extension of us. Facebook is an extension of us. Of us. Our phones are an extension of us. Our smart watches are extensions of who we are and what we do and where we go. This fourth revolution has the same triggers as the third revolution in many ways, but it's cyber meets human. It's the same in businesses, it's the same with law enforcement in terms of where they're pushing things. Everything will be integrated, customized, and smart automated. So, the Industrial Revolution will be automating complex tasks. It's the age of the Internet of Things. Cloud computing is something that we haven't even really stretched our comprehension of what it will be. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So, where the first three Industrial Revolutions were mainly about empowering organizations. Almost all innovation in the last few years has been driven by the consumer and is now changing organizations from the inside, which is something I'm going to be talking about in a future episode, about the understanding of moving from a shareholder way of company ownership to stakeholder, which is not something that you want, and I'll explain at that time. So when we look at the changes that are taking place, the next revolution will be in an invisible world. So far from the three main revolutions that have all been very visible and tangible, we could see the tablets, the iPhones, the wearables, they were all visible. But increases in our capabilities are empowered by technology that moves further out of sight, becomes somewhat invisible. Innovation will come from the shift to the cloud, invisible processing power, storage, and intelligence. More innovation will come from what's happening inside and around a device versus the object we can see, artificial intelligence, powerful algorithms. An ecosystem of computing will be simply surrounding us in everything, becoming so natural it will just about disappear into the background. It will become almost completely intrusive, but yet completely intrusive. It will fit into more parts of our world, and it will forcibly solve all of our problems for us without the slightest bit of human interaction. User interfaces will become integrated, and we will control them with voice, gaze, and gesture. We will see the results of those things, but with much less effort. And the irony is that it will control us more than we will control it. It will work seamlessly within itself, and we must learn to work within our new digital master that will need totality, a sort of digital totalitarianism, to operate properly. A world brain. A brain that does our thinking for us. To succeed, these plans of the World Economic Forum, of China, and others, will need synergized connectivity. Constant connectivity. And an all-in from every human being on the planet to be truly effective. 
there can't really be any one stray molecule for this to work. The Great Reset has to be complete. It has to be total. It has to be omnipresent. It has to be omnipotent. And it will possess omniscience. Everything about you, it will know. Everything about everybody else, it will know. And it must be measured and mathematical with an egalitarian and equity-based basis for human interaction. And now maybe seeing what is happening around you might start to make a little bit of sense. In other words, as we addressed in our previous podcasts, there are those that have goals to deconstruct and eliminate our current working systems to transition into new, cybernetic, digitally coerced, non-physical systems. In fact, this is not just happening with what is around us, but what it is a transition to us for humanity as we move towards a concept of a world brain. And as we are forcibly moved into the system that is necessary to operate a world brain concept, we have to be forced to remove the ideas of tribes, of nations, of personal autonomy, of cultures, volitional capabilities, etc., as nearly every current system with every single person that will need to be globally linked. And while you were going about your life over the last few years, trying to make a living, dealing with normal issues of life as they are, you most likely knew nothing about this. Well, where did these concepts come from that seek to have totalitarian control? Well, they came from people so much smarter than you. They came from elite thinkers that would get together and muse about these sorts of things consequentially. Futurists that consequentially understood that if we were to move from a capitalistic democracy to a synergized socialistic technocracy, which like China is today, by the way, we needed to ensure that booms and busts, fallible human decisions, and tribal and ethnic cultures and habits don't get in the way. So... Beginning in 1936, the Fabian socialist futurist, English science fiction pioneer, and social reformer, evolutionary biologist and historian, H.G. Wells, who was at this time, by the way, around 1936, he was in the middle of a love affair with Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger, began publishing his work on the concept of a world brain. Yes, this is the author of The Shape of things to come, which should be required reading for anybody that needs to understand what's going on today. Throughout his book, Wells described his vision of the world brain, a new, free, synthetic, authoritative, permanent brain administered by the technocratic elite that would help world citizens make the best use of universal information resources, and as well, make the best contribution to world peace. So to understand this properly and within context, I'm going to now quote from H.G. Wells' work, The World Brain. And I quote, Between the extremes of right and left hysteria, there remains a great underdeveloped region in the world of political thought and will that we may characterize as a do-nothing democracy. Out of the sudden realization of its do-nothingness, arise these psychological storms which give gangster dictators their opportunities. It is only gradually that people have come to realize that current democratic institutions are a very poor, slow, and slack method of conducting human affairs which need an exhaustive revision, and that when one has declared oneself anti-fascist, anti-communist, or both, one has still said precisely nothing about the government of the world. One is brought back to the unresolved problem of the competent receiver. It exercised Plato. It has been intermittently revived 
and neglected ever since. It is becoming apparent that the real clue to that reconciliation of freedom and sustained initiative with the more elaborate social organization which is being demanded from us lies in raising and unifying, and so implementing and making more effective the general intelligence services of the world. That, at least, is the argument in this book. The missing factor in human affairs, it is suggested here, is a gigantic and many-sided educational renaissance. The highly educated section, the finer minds of the human race, are so dispersed, so ineffectively related to the common man, that they are powerless in the face of political and social adventures of the coarsest sort. We want a reconditioned and more powerful public opinion. In a universal organization and clarification of knowledge and ideas, in a closer synthesis of university and educational activities, in the evocation, that is, of what I have here called a world brain, operating by an enhanced educational system through the whole body of mankind, a world brain which will replace our multitude of uncoordinated ganglia, our powerless miscellany of universities, research institutions, literatures with a purpose, national educational systems, and the like, in that and in that alone, it is maintained. Is there any clear hope of a really competent receiver for world affairs? Any hope of an adequate directive control of the present destructive drift of world affairs? We do not want dictators. We want a widespread world intelligence conscience of itself. To work out a way to that world brain organization is therefore our primary need in this age of imperative construction. It is an immense undertaking, but not an impossible undertaking. I do not think there is any insurmountable obstacle in the way to the production of such a ruling world brain. End quote from H.G. Wells. So in the year 2020, we now find ourselves at the precipice of realizing what seemed like impossible science fiction at the time that H.G. Wells had written that. The introduction of the world brain is now made possible in part through <laughs> the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. The Internet of Things is now upon us, and it will be the main source of conversation both in our discussion of ethics, our discussion of politics, and the understanding of human autonomy and liberty. The Internet of Things will impact how we live and how we work, how our economy works, how our policing is done, how our income will be redistributed through the grid work of intersectionality, how our liberty will be exercised. But what exactly is the Internet of Things, and what impact is it going to have on you? There are a lot of complexities around the discussion of the Internet of Things, but I want to stick to the basics. Lots of technical and policy-related conversations are being had, but it is here, the Internet of Things. And it will be one of the main threats to your ability to have privacy in your own personal direction of your life. So let's start with understanding just a few things. While in the past there were great wars over land and territory and natural resources, the big war today is being waged over a fight for data. Your data. What makes up you? What makes up everything? All of these things are creating a perfect storm for the blanket application of the Internet of Things. The concept of basically connecting any device or anything to the internet and to each other. So this does include everything from smartphones, computers, watches, and iPads, but now also coffee makers, washing machines, headphones, lamps, wearable devices, clothing, cups, flooring, wallpaper, automobiles, planes, shoes, medicine nanotechnology, almost anything you can think of. 
This also applies to the components of those machines. For example, like a jet engine of an airplane or the drill of an oil rig. So not just everything, but everything that is within things. And all things will be in the Internet of Things. And they will be transmitted and analyzed through artificial intelligence in an ever-growing, ever-learning global brain. So as I mentioned, if it is physical, chances are it can be part of the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is a giant network of connected things, hence the global brain. All relationships, both with people to people, with person to government, will all be through this system of the Internet of Things, of artificial intelligence, of the fourth industrial revolution. Those relationships will be between people, 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 things, and things, things, as things have intelligence. They have thought. They can learn on their own. Corporations and manufacturers are adding sensors to components of every part of their products so they can transmit data back about how they're performing, about how you're performing, about, let's say, what your temperature is, what your physical condition is, what you're doing right now, what you're saying right now, what sort of intimate, personal, or even sexual experiences you're having right now. What you're thinking right now. And as the real and the surreal will be blended within this new digital age, what somebody else wants you to think about right now. And as you're thinking about all these things that we've been discussing consequentially, how does this affect everything that's currently an issue today? Such as the future of policing. Such as the future of our economy. The future of our concept of family. Well, these are things that we're going to be thinking about and discussing on the causes of things. I hope you'll make time to join us as we go deep. We're going to go so deep that we're going to be getting into the scary portion of things. But you need to start talking about these things now. We need to get past the surface, just the what is happening around us. We need to get into the why and the how. And always remember this. The person that knows how will ultimately always work for the person that knows why. I'm Mike O'Fallon, and this has been The Causes of Things. And that was from July of 2020. It probably feels like it could have been a century ago. Donald Trump was our president then. Because our world has changed so much since July of 2020. And the reason? Our world and our nation was being reset. And if I had told you at the time that you might lose your job for not taking the vaccine, you'd have thought that I was nuts. If I told you that nearly every nation on earth was going to create a massive division in society between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, you would have thought that I was nuts. If I told you back then that everything would be switching from the virus to massive climate change, where our gasoline is going to go up a dollar, dollar fifty, two, three dollars a gallon quickly within a year, you would have thought I was nuts. But I did tell you that. And I told you that we were being transitioned from an analog, physical, 
real objective world into a digital, unreal, subjective, fake world. And very few, very few, paid any attention. And now, welcome to Metasystem Change in the new metaverse. As we are all forcibly shoved into the fourth industrial revolution. The time to push back is now. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. <laughs>